Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, to the organizers for the invitation to speak here. Uh, the work I'm going to be talking about is uh, it's a few different projects, but they're all joint with Ivo Gao, who's also a student at MIT. Um, so I'm kind of lumping together a couple things here. Um, but they, they both have to do with the weak order on the symmetric group or on another coxa group, which I'll define on the next slide. And uh, both will have some, uh, something to say about a few topics we've already seen today. So um, either I'm, I'm lucky or the organizers uh, did this on purpose, but I, I'm going to mention things about, uh, I don't know what a Scubbert polynomial is, but uh, talk about <laughs> something about principal specializations of Schubert polynomials. Later on, I'll say some things about linear extensions of post sets and uh, a few of these other topics. Um, OK, so, so, so what is the weak order? Um, so, so just a disclaimer to begin with, a lot of the definitions and theorems I'm going to be making have, you, you, can, you can guess the same theorems and results for any finite Coxeter group. In general, they seem to be true, but in general, they don't have uniform proofs uh, ex with a few exceptions. And so throughout the talk, I'm just going to talk about the symmetric group, and you can fill in whatever you like in your head. Um, so SN is the symmetric group. I write SI for the simple transpositions and TIG, TIJ for a uh, general transposition. Uh, the length of a permutation, it's also the number of inversions. It's, it's the fewest number of simple transpositions I need to write my permutation as a product. So the weak order, which will be bold W sub n, is a partial order on the symmetric group. And it has covering relations. So dot means cover relation. Uh, so going up one step in the post set is uh, multiplying um, on the right by a simple transposition, such that my length increases. Uh, another partial order which is going to come into play is the strong order, sometimes called the Bruja order. Um, and I'll use a curly less than or equal to for that. So this one has covering relations corresponding to any transposition, but I still require that my length increases by only one. So in general, if I multiply by some generic transposition, my length could change by more than one, but, but I'm only looking at certain of those cover relations. So both these post sets, they're ranked graded post sets. The rank function is the length. They have unique minimal element, which is the identity permutation, and unique maximal element, which is this, uh, I'll write w naught, which is this reverse permutation. The length of w naught is n choose 2. And in a lot of formulas throughout, the, the n choose 2 occurs in exponents and subscripts and so on. So I'll, I'll write capital N for that sometimes. Um, OK, so just why might you care about some of these things? So weak order, the Hassa diagram is the Cayley graph for the symmetric group with my favorite set of generators, maybe yours. Um, it's the one skeleton of a nice polytope called the permutahedron. Saturated chains in the weak order, the same thing as reduced decompositions of permutations, which show up in a lot of places, and including um, some places we've already seen today. Maximal chains in the weak order are sometimes called sorting networks, and some people in the room have studied these from a, a probabilistic point of view. Um, and there are also inter uh, intervals in weak order which give intervals in Young's lattice. So in general, the interval below a rectangle in Young's lattice is an interval in weak order. And so if, if we look at all weak, order, weak orders, we actually have a copy of Young's lattice sitting inside there. On the other hand, strong order shows up. Uh, it describes containment of Schubert varieties in, in the flag manifold. And because of this, shows up in kazan lustig theory and all, all throughout algebraic geometry and representation theory. Um, OK, so here are some pictures. This is symmetric group S3. Here are, um, this is the weak order. So covering relation corresponds to, corresponds to swapping uh, numbers which are next to each other. Here's the strong order. I, I've gained these two additional covering relations where the numbers I'm swapping are not next to each other, um, but such that my length still increases by only one. OK, so to start with, uh, the original problem we were looking at, which um, kind of led us on an interesting journey, journey is uh, the Spruner property for, for the weak order. So a rank post set, so here I'm writing P as a disjoint union of, of the level sets of the elements at, at a given height in this post set. Um, it's called Spruner if no anti-chain of P 
if you remember from a uh, talk earlier, an antichain is a collection of pairwise and comparable elements. If no antichain is larger than the largest of these ranks, a poset is called Sperner. Okay, so clearly any one of these ranks is an antichain, but we ask that there aren't any bigger ones. Uh, more generally, P is K Sperner. If no union of K antichains is larger than the union of the largest K ranks. And strongly Sperner, if that's true for every K. So, so where does this name come from? There's a classic uh, theorem called Sperner's theorem that if A is a collection of subsets of this is the set 1 up to N, such that no element in A contains another, then A can't be any bigger than this central binomial coefficient. Said another way, the Boolean lattice is Sperner. This condition here says that A is an antichain in the Boolean lattice. This is the largest rank size in the Boolean lattice because rank sizes are binomial coefficients, so, so those are the same thing. And then that's why the name is attached to this. Yep. Uh, I just mean in, in size. Cardinality. Yep. Yep. Okay, so um, one of the tools uh, we're going to have to prove things about the Sperner properties is a linear algebraic technique that was pioneered by Stanley. So, so CP is the vector space just spanned by uh, the elements of P, so formal linear combinations of elements of my poset. So we call a linear operator D a order lowering operator if it sends elements in rank I to elements one rank below for all I, and if it respects the partial order. So if Y is an element in rank I, D should send it to a linear combination of elements which are, um, which are actually below it in the poset. So in other words, this is the same information as putting a number on each of the cover relations in my poset which correspond to these coefficients cx. So why this is useful is that Stanley proved in a pioneering paper in 1980 that <coughs> P is, okay, so here's a trio of properties. P is rank symmetric, rank unimodal, and strongly Sperner, if and only if there is such an operator, such that when I compose it um, from the, if R is the maximal rank, if I compose it to get from the R minus ith rank to the ith rank, then that's always an isomorphism. Um, okay, so what, what do these mean? Rank symmetric, that just says these, these things better have the same dimensions, so I, sh I should have the same number of elements in rank R minus I as rank I. And rank unimodal means that my rank sizes increase and then decrease. Okay, so, so this is the technique we're going to want to use to fi find an appropriate operator. Um, so one application of this, uh, of Stanley, which I just want to mention because it's pretty is that, is that the strong order on any vial group has the strong Sperner property that I defined earlier. And the proof of this, well, there's a one-liner. If, if you know something about cohomology of flag varieties, if you don't, then there's some magic linear operator coming from algebraic geometry that, that does everything you want. Um, in, this is a really beautiful paper. He uses this to solve some conjecture of Erdős about subsets of integers who have the most Sub subset sums colliding, and uh, I would have never have thought to use hard left shift theorem to do that, but, but Stanley did. So, so in particular, we know, we know the strong order has the strong Sperner property. If you remember, the weak order has fewer cover relations. It's, it's a coarser post set. So it, it's harder to prove that it's Sperner because it could potentially have some larger antichains that we want to rule out. So Bjorner asked, a natural strengthening of this question, is the weak order also strongly Sperner? So that was in 1984, and uh, essentially there were a couple papers on it, but, but nobody knew, knew quite, um, quite which direction to guess until Stanley um, in 2017, in the same Schubert shenanigans paper that Alejandro <coughs> referenced, he suggested, he, he conjectured that the answer is yes, it is strongly Sperner, and his reasoning for making that conjecture is he had a guess for what what the order lowering operator should be. So this might look a little weird because it's sort of asymmetric, but, but if you remember, for example, McDonald's formula for specializations of Schubert polynomials, this is less weird than it looks. So the operator that Stanley suggests is with coefficient i, I get the element where I'm multiplying by the symbol transposition si. 
And he conjectured, because he could compute determinants and they seem to be non-zero, that if you do the, if you compose this operator with itself a bunch of times, that, that these are all invertible, which by the previous proposition would imply the Sperner property we're interested in. So, so it now, we now just need to understand these operators and, and prove that they are invertible. Um, so to do this, um, we're going to introduce an auxiliary operator, which a priori, uh, its only purpose is to help us prove that D is invertible, but actually it will end up leading to some interesting combinatorics later. So we call this operator U, U for up instead of down. And this one, interestingly, is supported exactly on the strong order. So it's a raising operator for the strong order rather than the weak order. So to every cover relation where I'm multiplying by a transposition ij, we get this coefficient here. What is this coefficient? Well, there's a vector associated to any permutation called its code, which looks at inversions uh, and sorts them by position. So for each position, how, how many things to the right of me am I bigger than? And I just, I just look at the L1 distance between these two codes. That's, that's the labels we're going to use. Uh, so, so here's a picture. So this is the weak and strong order before. These uh, labels on the edges are the labels that Stanley suggests we use for the lowering operator. These labels uh, on the edges of the strong order are the weights I just defined. And so here, for every permutation, I, I've written its code instead. So for example, the code of 312 is 20, and 132 is 12, and the L1 distance between these is 3, and that's how we get that number. OK, so here's a crash course in representations of SL2. If I, I don't know if many people in the audience need this, but certainly algebra SL2 is defined by these relations. Um, the important thing for us is that a representation of SL2 has a weight space decomposition. Uh, essentially a decomposition to eigenspaces for H. And these last two bullet points, well really this last bullet point is what's going to be important for us. So if I compose, if I act by E many times to get from the negative J weight space to the positive J weight space, or similarly for F, those just linear operators, those aren't invertible. Um, okay, so that sort of gives away my strategy here. This is Stanley's suggestion of a lowering operator for the weak order. This is the operator we just came up with for the strong order. I need one more. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of force. So H is a diagonal operator on, on this vector space. And it just sends an element to twice its length minus n choose 2 times itself. And then the theorem is that this trio of operators actually satisfies the right relations for SL2. So we have a representation of SL2. In particular, the fact I just told you about SL2 representation says that if we compose D the right number of times, those are invertible. And by Stanley's criterion for, for the strong Sperner property, this answers Brunner's question. It's, it solves Stanley's conjecture. The weak order is strongly Sperner. OK, so a couple corollaries for that, because this is about anti-chains in the weak order. Um, Probably some, something that has received a lot more attention are chains in the weak order because these correspond to sorting networks or reduced decompositions. So what does this result say about those? Um, so one is just Dilworth's theorem or a special case of Green-Kleitman. So the size of the largest anti-chain is also the fewest number of chains you need to cover it. So, so the fewest number of chains uh, you need to cover the weak order is the, is the largest coefficient of the Q analog of n factorial because this is the rank generating function of, of weak order. Um, another thing which, which I think is interesting but I, I haven't thought more about is that this property here is actually equivalent to being symmetric unimodal and strongly Sperner. So this says for every k, there exist families of non-intersecting saturated chains in the weak order with one endpoint at all my elements of rank k, which go up to all the elements of rank n choose 2 minus k. So a maximal chain is the k equals 0 case. And these have a beautiful theory of what random elements of that look like, their enumeration, and so on. 
So I think there might be some interesting problems to enumerate these systems of chains or, or what does a random system of, of these look like. OK. Can I ask a quick question? You may. On, on the previous slide. So you have an action of SL2 on, on, on this base of dimension, I guess, n factorial. Do we, know, do we know anything about this representation, like its decomposition into irreducibles and stuff like that? Right. So that's a little boring because SL2 irreducibles are determined by their dimension. And because this, uh, this, so weight spaces of this representation are, uh, right. are the rank sizes. And so, and so one, once I know the rank sizes, right, right. well, you can determine the irreducible decomposition. Um, but uh, so some of what I'm going to say gi gives sort of a different basis for this action, which, which also looks natural. And so it tells us something else about this representation. Um, OK, so, so far. We've succeeded in our original aim of approving the Sperner property for the weak order. Um, but it seems like there's more going on because this, this raising operator that was originally just an auxiliary tool actually ended up being interesting and, and being supported exactly on the strong order and, and having combinatorially, combinatorially defined coefficients. So, so in this next section, I'm going to explore some consequences of that. So these Schubert polynomials, we've, we've already seen a couple times today. I'm going to define them in a little bit different way. So Alejandro told us they're a generating function for um, pipe dreams. Uh, there, there's another algebraic way to define them, which is that the Schubert polynomial corresponding to the longest permutation is this staircase monomial. So I'm using this notation of, um, of monomials. Um, and I, I define Schubert polynomials for shorter permutations uh, in terms of this Newton divided difference operator. Um, so the ith divided difference operator applied to here p is a polynomial in, in the x variables. I take the polynomial, uh, I subtract, uh, so si acts on p by interchanging xi and xi plus 1. This thing is divisible by xi minus xi plus 1, and I, so I can divide that out. And this is still a polynomial. So it's easy to see here then, because this operation always reduces my degree by 1, that each Schubert polynomial, it's homogeneous of degree equal to the length of the permutation. And it's also a fact that uh, this set of Schubert polynomials forms a basis for the span of these monomials, which are entry-wise less than or equal to this staircase one. So in some of the previous talks, we were thinking of Schubert polynomials living in some quotient space, but it's actually more convenient in this context to view them living in this space instead. OK, so um, define, I guess this is called nabla, uh, direct sum of the partial derivative, the sum of the partial derivatives with respect to each variable. So Hemmeker, Pachenik, Speyer, and Wigand, they uh, found uh, another natural context in which these weights that we were getting before appear. So they said, if I take a Schubert polynomial and I apply this differential operator, I get the sum of things below me in the weak order, and the coefficient is this i when I've multiplied by si. So in other words, if we multiply, or sorry, if we identify linear combinations of permutations and this vector space uh, of spanned by certain monomials by just associating w with its Schubert polynomial, then Stanley's operator d that he suggested is exactly this differential operator. And they, uh, so this paper was a couple weeks after uh, our paper was posted, and they were able to use this to now, Stanley actually had an explicit conjecture for what the determinant of these maps are, and they were able to compute this because now they have a a different basis to work in, essentially. They have a basis of monomials, which is easier to do some computations in. And, and this is really beautiful. So this setup also allows an extremely quick proof of a classical identity, which we've already seen today, due to McDonald for specializations of Schubert polynomials at all ones. Again, this expression says you take a reduced word for w, you multiply the indices of the simple transpositions you've used, and you divide by the length factorial. Um, but now, now this is immediate once you know this formula, because this is a homogeneous polynomial of degree L, L of W. We apply this, apply the operator that many times. 
I'm going to get a number. And if you just think about how applying this operator to homogeneous polynomials works, this is the number I'm going to get. But on the other hand, by, by this proposition, it's easy for us to write down exactly what it is in terms of these sequences. And so once we divide, we, we prove, uh, sorry, these people prove uh, uh, McDonald's identity again. OK, so, so that, uh, those last couple of results were, were of a different group. I'm now going to return um, to my work with Ebo. Um, and, and the fact that the strong order was showing up, and, and what can we say in this context with the strong order? So we're going to do something which seems kind of trivial, but will be convenient. So we're going to pad our Schubert polynomials. So every monomial x to the alpha, you know, any, remember, alphas are compositions which are less than beta. Any, less than rho, sorry. Any part of rho we haven't used already for the x's, we're just going to throw in some y's. OK, so, so this is the map. And now we're working in this new vector space. Um, and, and the advantage of this is that we can, it now makes, to think about, it makes sense to think about two different differential operators. So this first one is essentially what they were doing before. Because if we set all the y's to 1, this is their operator, nabla. So, but it now makes sense to define delta, which, which is this one here. So I'm multiplying by the xi's and taking partials with respect to the yi's. So our theorem then is, this theorem is essentially a restatement of Hamaker et al.'s result. Uh, but this one is new. And, and these are the same weights that were appearing before with our raising operator. So if you instead apply this different differential operator to these padded Schubert polynomials and expand it in the padded Schubert basis, you get these coefficients that were appearing before that are L1 distances between codes. And as a corollary, we actually get a new strong order version of McDonald's identity. Uh, and, and this is an identity for the same thing, specializations at one of the usual Schubert polynomials. So if you remember before, we divide by a factorial. We're looking at paths up to w in the weak order. We take the sum of the weights of those paths. It's exactly the same here, thing here, but in the strong order. So we're dividing by a factorial. We look at paths now from w up to w, the longest element. And these are paths in the strong order. And again, you take the product of now our strong order weights. And, and, and I should say, the proof of this is exactly like Hamaker et al.'s proof of the, uh, their new proof of McDonald's original identity. You just apply this operator a bunch of times and compare both sides. OK. Um, yeah, so he, here's an example. Schubert polynomial S132. Uh, that's x1 plus x2. Uh, we pad it so that uh, I always have degree 2 in the 1 variables and 1 in the degree 2 in the two, 2 variables. So it pads like this. We apply this operator, which is taking partial derivatives with respect to x's and multiplying by y's. We get this, which is twice the padded Schubert polynomial of the identity. So that says if I start here, I apply that differential operator, well, there's only one edge below me. With coefficient 2, I get this. If you apply this other operator, we're differentiating respect to y. You get this expression, and that corresponds to the fact that if I start from 1, 3, 2, I've got two edges going up, one with label 1 and one la with, with label 3. Uh, similarly, for the specialization, there's two ways to get the specialization 2. Either you take these two weighted paths and divide by one factorial. Or you take this pad of weight 1, this of weight 3, and now divide by 2 factorial. OK. Um, so one particular case of the formula, as I just showed you, is that the total number of weighted paths with these uh, the weights coming from the code, from the identity all the way to w0, is n choose 2 factorial. Um, there are some other known path counting identities in the broad order which give you the same quantity and choose 2 factorial. In particular, there are a very well studied family of weights called, uh, well, we're going to call the Chevalier weights, but these are originally introduced by Chevalier. They've been studied by Stemridge and Postnikov Stanley, among others. And in this case, to a covering relation 
u covered by u times the transposition ij, we just give it weight j minus i. And uh, as I was saying, it's known that the total number of weighted paths from the identity up to w naught is just n choose 2 factorial. So uh, is there a common generalization of, of these weights we had coming from codes and these more classical Chevrolet weights? Um, it turns out there is. So, so this picture here, this is a permutation matrix. And we're thinking about a cover relation in strong order. So what that looks like is, um, so if V is covered by W, these dots are, are say, ones in the uh, permutation matrix of V. And if I sort of swap this rectangle and replace them with these ones, that gives me W. The fact that it's a cover relation in Bruja order says that there are, no, there are no ones in this region. Now, the quantities we're going to look at, uh, so we're going to look at these four regions of the, uh, of the permutation matrix. And by A, B, C, and D, I just mean the number of ones in this, these regions of the permutation matrix. So it's not so hard to see then that the Chevrolet weight, in this case, can be expressed as 1 plus B plus D. And it's a, it's a little exercise that our weights from earlier, these were the ones that were the L1 distance between the codes, is 1 plus 2B. Um, so in general, let, let's study this more general family where I take some linear combination of, uh, of these ABCD weights and add one and call these generalized Bruja weights. And we're going to look at weighted path counting again. OK, so this first theorem says that if, if we're, so we're going to take a weight function and count weighted paths. Um, if I specialize these parameters from the previous slide to in any way you like to be 0, 0, z, and 2 minus z, um, then we get this result that the total number of weighted paths will still be inches 2 factorial. And in particular, it doesn't depend on z, so, um, which is a little surprising perhaps. So, so both of these weights fit into this family where I've got two of my coefficients, the coefficients of a and c are 0, and the other two coefficients sum, sum to 2. So, so this is a common generalization of, of both of those families of weights. Um, we can say something much stronger in the case where the variable, so again, I'm specializing my variables to look like this, but now the ones I'm not setting to 0, I'm requiring to be cyclically consecutive into this picture. So I'm taking a and b non-zero, or b and c, or c and d, or d and a. In that case, the weighted path count from any permutation up to the longest element, not just from the identity, is actually a multiple of the specialization of the Schubert polynomial. And again, it does not depend on z. So, so this gives a one parameter family of generalizations of the strong order version of McDonald's formula that I showed earlier. OK, so that was the first part of the talk. I'm, uh, the, the next part is, is not directly related. It was, it was originally sort of related in our thinking, but, but it's sort of gone in other directions. But it's also uh, related to, to the weak order. And, and now we're going to see some consequences for linear extensions of post sets and things like this. So maybe before I move on to this uh, adjacent topic, I should uh, ask if there are any questions about the first part so far? OK. Um, all right, so subgroups and quotients. So much of the following, again, makes sense and works in any vial group. But let me focus on the symmetric group. So let V be an arbitrary subset. Uh, and I guess I'm probably going to frequently write W for the symmetric group just because of um, because I'm thinking a little bit more generally. Uh, so V is any subset. The generalized quotient, it's those elements in the vial group whose, which are length additive when I multiply by any element of V. So the length of a product can clearly not be any bigger than the sum of the lengths. But when, when that's actually equal for all elements of V, we say W is in this generalized quotient. So this was defined by Bjorner and Wax in the 80s. So th there's one example of this, which is 
very classical, perhaps more familiar. So if j is a subset of my simple generators, uh, the parabolic subgroup w wj is just a subgroup generated by those. So in the case of the symmetric group, this will just look like a product of smaller symmetric groups. And the parabolic quotient, which is very classical, is w mod wj. So it's the elements which are length additive with respect to all elements of this subgroup. Um, so in the case of the symmetric group, uh, it can be expressed in terms of descents like this. Um, yeah. So I think of these as like a choice of representative in the coset space w. That's right. Uh, another, another way to say it is that these are the collection. Each, each coset of W sub J in W has a unique representative of minimal length, and these are that, those collection of representatives. Um, OK, and one more theorem. So in the special case where this arbitrary subset here, V, is actually an interval in weak order, um, then this quotient is also an interval in weak order. So, so here I've added R and L. If you remember when I originally defined the weak order, I said W is less than WSIs. Well, there was a choice here that I multiplied on the right rather than the left, and, and it does matter. So, so the one I had been using before is the right weak order, and the left weak order is analogous where I multiply by SI on the left. So, so if V is an interval in right weak order, this parabolic quotient is an interval in left weak order. So uh, we can note that this is actually the case for parabolic subgroups and parabolic quotients. It turns out this subgroup is actually the interval below the longest element of this parabolic subgroup. And this quotient is also an interval in left weak order. OK, um, the property that we're going to be interested in, which is exemplified by the parabolic quotient and the parabolic subgroup, is that it's what we call a splitting of W. So for arbitrary subsets x and y of w, we say that they form a splitting if the map which just multiplies elements, one from x and one from y, it's length additive, meaning this, and it's a bijection to the whole group. So the fact that these are all length additive says, for example, that x is contained in this generalized quotient. So it's not so hard to see. It's well known that this pair <coughs> that I defined on the previous slide of a parabolic quotient <coughs> and a parabolic subgroup is always a splitting in this sense. And you can ask, as Bjorn and Wax did in 1988, what are all the splittings of the symmetric group? OK. Um, yeah, so for example, the, the way to view this as a splitting, so let's just say we're the case J is everything but one generator SK. So the parabolic subgroup is like SK times SN minus K acting on different sets of indices. Then this says something like, I can get any permutation by shuffling in any way I like the cards 1 up to K and K plus 1 up to N, and then doing one uh, riffle shuffle of, of those. So, so what are all splittings? What are all pairs of subsets which have this property of being length additive and a bijection? <coughs> OK, so uh, let me define some class of permutations. So this, this class of permutations was defined prior to our work. And uh, we defined elements analogous to these in any vial group. But, but I don't want to go into that because it requires a little bit more terminology. Um, so, so a permutation is called separable if it avoids these two patterns. <coughs> Avoiding a pattern means I have no subsequence of my permutation, viewing it as a word, which are in these relative orders. Uh, an equivalent, uh, equivalent characterization of separable permutations is that a permutation is separable if and only if its permutation matrix can be recursively built starting from the only permutation of one by using these operations. So if w and w prime are smaller separable things, I'm allowed to put them sort of block diagonally or block anti-diagonally. OK, so, so remember this question we're interested in is what are all the splittings? And the theorem is that you're splitting, well, 
first of all, it's non-trivial that, that the elements of the splitting have to be intervals in weak order, but they are. They have their intervals. Uh, one is an interval in right order, and one is an interval in left order. And the intervals which give a splitting are exactly when y is separable. OK, um, so, so we know exactly when we can decompose the symmetric group bijectively as a product of these smaller subsets. Um, be, because all the ways to do that turned out to be of the form weak intervals, what, what can we say about general intervals when, uh, when y is not necessarily separable? And it turns out that now the multiplication map multiplying an element of this generalized quotient times an element of this interval is always surjective. So it's bijective if and only if uh, y, uh, v in this case is separable, but it's always surjective. And this is a surprisingly difficult theorem. Um, and as we'll see uh, in the next slide or two, um, this gives a combinatorial proof of an inequality for the number of linear extensions of certain postsets, um, which answers a problem that uh, Morales, Pock, and Panova had, had posed. <coughs> OK, so, so to say exactly what problem it answers, uh, I need to make a few definitions. So if w is a permutation, we can define a post set, which I'll write p sub w, um, on elements p sub 1 up to p sub n, where uh, p i is less than p j, if and only if i is less than j, and i appears to the left of j in w. OK? These, this class of postsets you can get from this construction are called two-dimensional postsets. And a linear extension, as we saw in the uh, previous talk, is an order-preserving bijection from a postset with n elements up to, this, to the set 1 up to n, where, where we put the usual order on these numbers. And the number of these we'll, we'll denote by E of p. So it's a classical fact that the number of linear extensions of this poset PW is the size of this interval in weak order. So, Sidorenko um, in the 90s, using some recurrences and min flow, max cut sort of arguments, um, proved the following inequality, which is that the number of linear extensions correspond for the poset corresponding to W and the number of linear extensions, this is ends up being the reverse of w, that product is at least n factorial. So there, there have been several proofs of this in the literature. One, as I said, is um, Sidorenko's original proof. There's another proof which uses some special case of the Mahler conjecture, which is still an open problem in convex geometry. Um, but those aren't very satisfying, because these are nice combinatorial sets, and, and there should just be some explicit map which, which proves this. And, and we now have one, so this, the number of these linear extensions by Bjorner's theorem are the sizes of two weak order intervals. Uh, taking inverses sends this right interval to this left interval. And by our theorem that multiplication of intervals of this form is surjective onto the whole group, this is at least n factorial. So we have an explicit surjection from sets which are clearly of the size to a set of size n vectorial. OK, um, I've not included in these slides, but, but these several elements uh, seem, seem cool, seem interesting. So a few more facts which we know about them. So, so these are for now any vial group, um, which I ha so I haven't defined what a separable element in another vial group is. But they always turn out to be in bijection with faces of all dimensions of something called the isosahedron, or more specifically, the graph isosahedron of the graph being the Dinka diagram of whatever type you're working in. Um, there's nice product formulas for the Q enumeration of these weak order intervals where I enumerate by length. Um, these have a really um, nice product formula. And so, in fact, we give a Q analog of Sidorenko's identity that if I look at linear extensions of these two postsets and I also um, enumerate them by length, take the product of those two polynomials, that will be uh, coefficient-wise 
at least as big as the Q analog ran factorial. And there also, there's a way to talk about pattern avoidance and general root systems, which is very completely type independent. And it, it's true that our more general, that our separable elements in other types are characterized by pattern avoidance in this root system sense. Um, in fact, so there are these two length four permutation patterns. So there's two patterns of type A, A3 you need to avoid. And it turns out there's just, there's just two more of type B2. Um, and that, that's all you need to avoid to be separable. And um, that's all I've got for you. Thanks. <laughs>